Being an author of Great Lakes Maritime History, as a part of my job, I spend a lot of time looking at pictures. When you study these historic images, you often discover some interesting stuff, and you come up with some curious questions. Many times the old coal-burning boats have huge piles of coal overflowing out of their fuel bunkers, like this. Normally this is just enough for a single round trip. We'd assume that getting the coal fuel aboard the freighter was as simple as hauling up under the spout at the coal dock and having the spout swung over and dump it on board. The problem was that there were far more boats that needed to be fueled than there was dock space. So, if that was the only way to get fueled, the lines of boats waiting would be very long, and the delay between unloading, fueling, and departing would eat away at the profits. In the late 1880s, as vessel traffic rapidly grew, places such as Astrabula only had a couple of coal fueling docks, but plenty of freighter traffic. There had to be a better way to fuel the steamers. The answer came when someone had the idea to use lighter vessels, which were normally used for removing cargo from stranded lake boats, to take fuel to the boats instead of the boats coming to the fuel. This could be done while they were loading or unloading. There is no good record as to where or exactly when this began, but it worked. Soon scows were specifically constructed to do the job, and containers, called buckets, were used to move the coal to the waiting freighter. My question, when looking at these square buckets, was how much coal did each bucket hold? It was an obscure question that just sort of hung out in the back of my brain, nagging me. I needed to go and learn more about these coal scows starting with what they were actually called. My first stop was Marine Review, but not in the text itself. If you want to know what something was called more than a century ago, you don't look at the engineering language in Marine Review. You go look at the advertisements. After all, plain talk in ordinary terms of the day is what sells products. And here I found it. Fuel lighters is what they were called. And later I saw the term fuel scow used as well. Here's one doing the job. Let's take a closer look and learn a bit more about them. These two rails support the whirly crane that lifts the buckets. The rails run the full length of the scow and allow access to all of the buckets. In July of 1896, the M.A. Hanna Company introduced a new type of fuel lighter at Ashtabula. At 180 feet long, the self-propelled scow had 16 pockets, each of which could be loaded with a different grade of coal. Hopper doors in the bottom of each pocket dropped the coal into a tunnel where a continuous scraper fed it to a hopper, which fed it to one of two elevators that hoisted the coal into a circular chute, which was lowered into the boat's fuel bunker. Here it is seen fueling the steamer Cambria. This system could feed 150 tons per hour. One year earlier, Captain James Dunham of Chicago came up with a different innovation in fuel lighters. To him, the pointed corners on the fuel lighters being used across all of the lower lakes represented an accident waiting to happen. He said he suspected over the years that some big steamer with a valuable cargo aboard would be sunk in the river by running into the sharp pointed corners of one of those fuel scows. His answer was to build a series of scow fuel lighters with very rounded corners. Seen here is one of Captain Dunham's rounded corner scow fuel lighters. This is the only photo I've ever seen of a Dunham fuel lighter. Looking closely at it, we can learn a bit about how these fuel lighters actually functioned. 
we can tell that the fuel lighter is at the coal dock getting refilled because nearly all of her buckets are empty. This is a funnel to allow the coal to be dropped into the buckets with minimal spillage. It is moved across the deck or thwartwise on these wheels which run on these rails. This is Gustav and Stashu. Okay, I don't know their real names. Gustav was a friend of mine in the first grade and my grandpa used to call me Stashu. So I use those names because they seem to fit. Anyhow, they are how the funnel is moved, by hand. They look happy because the boat came in empty and now they get to fill her for a second time today. You see, they were not paid by the hour. They were paid by the ton. And here's how the whirly crane moved up and down the deck rails. This chain attached to that wheel, when engaged, made the crane go forward and aft. The crane's own steam engine provided the power for that. Here we see the crane using its clamshell to go over to the rail cars seen in the background and scoop coal up to be fed into the funnel. When the fuel lighter was away from the dock, the clamshell was not used in fueling. Instead, the crane was only used to lift and lower the buckets. Also notice the buckets on the wharf. These are either spares or damaged buckets waiting for repair, or both. Oh, and what about my question as to how much coal each bucket contains? Well, I got the answer to that by using my time-trusted method of researching Great Lakes history. I stumbled across it while looking for something totally different. As I was looking through the 1897 Blue Book of American Shipping on the Maritime History of the Great Lakes website, I found this, an ad for the Pittsburgh and Chicago Gas and Coal Company featuring a fuel lighter. And right here, it boasts that each bucket carries two and one-half tons. There is my answer. But hey, along the way, we learned a lot.